So uh, with that, I want to uh, lead us into uh, our keynote, which is uh, Hubert Dreyfus. Um, Hubert Dreyfus is the senator for the state of Michigan uh, that encompasses Detroit City. He was elected to represent the state of Michigan in Washington, D.C., and he's the creator and the upholder of the Dreyfus Act, which is a national law that forbids robots' uh, use in police and military ends in the United States based on the lack of empathy the machines uh, would have when upkeeping law enforcement. Uh, this places Dreyfus at odds with the robotics corporations who wish to further robot sales and contracts in the U.S., something that the Dreyfus Act uh, clearly bars. Of course, this is a different Dreyfus. This is uh, actually a nice homage. So this is actually Senator Dreyfus was named after our esteemed uh, real-life, true, original Dreyfus, who's going to be here, as here today to talk. But this was in the recently released RoboCop film. There is a character called Hubert Dreyfus, named after the real-life philosopher and critic of AI research. He, in the movie, he pushes legislation to prevent robots from being allowed to make the kill decision uh, because he argues they can't understand the value of human life. Um, Fortunately, we are of the genuine persuasion, so we have with us the genuine, original, and true philosopher. <laughs> uh, so this is the Hubert Dreyfus here. Oh, he's got to get this photo. <laughs> yeah. How cool is that to be in a movie? That's pretty cool. <laughs> So uh, Hubert Dreyfus is a professor here in philosophy at the Graduate School at University of California, Berkeley. Many of you know of his very highly esteemed work. He received his PhD from Harvard University. Uh, he taught at MIT before he uh, became wise and he came here to Berkeley and has laid forth some tremendous uh, groundbreaking work. He's best known for his book, What Computers Can't Do, which was uh, not only translated into many different languages, but actually grew out of his encounters with computer scientists working on artificial intelligence at MIT, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that today. Uh, using arguments drawn from existential uh, phenomenologists, uh, Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, he predicted the attempts to make computers behave intelligently, like HAL and, and other similar systems, uh, that uh, by giving them rules and for making inferences would actually fail by the end of the 20th century, and in many cases, indeed, they have. He's written a number of other influential books, uh, Being in the World, where he explains Heidegger's ideas in a natural, accessible uh, um, way to Anglo-American style philosophers, and is actually credited for having a lot of his um, writings and Heidegger being part of curriculum at major American universities, and I know that's true with a lot of my colleagues. Uh, he also has a book on the internet that draws on the work of Merleau-Ponty to show how relevance, a sense of reality, and the possibility of serious commitments are lost uh, when one gives up one's body to uh, enter cyberspace. And his latest book was Sean Kelly, All Things Shining. He uses the greatest works in the Western canon to show step by step how our culture lost its sense of enchantment and meeting. He's not only a Guggenheim uh, Fellow recipient, he's uh, been awarded numerous grants by the National Science Foundation, National Endowment for Humanities. Um, he's a Fellow of the American Academy of Sciences. Um, and it's a real pleasure to welcome him today to talk about symbolic AI, existential phenomenology, and the future of robotics. Professor Hubert Dreyfus. Thanks, Eric. That's very nice. And I, I, rather than hide behind this or be lost behind it, I'm going to come out into the light here. And I'm going to, but, but like a philosopher, unfortunately, I'm going to read this. It's, uh, it's, philosophers spend lots of trouble trying to say exactly clearly what they want to say, and then they just don't want to just ad lib, so you have to put up with me reading it. But it isn't, since, since somehow I'm not exactly producing graphs and reports on my research, PowerPoint doesn't seem right either, so this is the best I can do. So here we go. While teaching humanities at MIT in the early 60s, I was invited by the RAND Corporation to evaluate the, pri the pioneering work of Alan Newell and Herbert Simon in a new field called cognitive simulation. Newell and Simon claimed that both digital computers and the human mind could be understood as what they call physical symbol systems. That is, strings of bits or streams of neuron pulses could be used as symbols representing features of what they call the external world. 
sort of outside the mind or outside the computer. Intelligence, they claimed, simply required drawing the appropriate conclusions from these internal representations. So, they conclude, a physical symbol system has the necessary and sufficient means for general intelligent action. And philosophy, they declared, and their students, when I used to teach at MIT, would come to me and say, well, philosophy has been left behind. You had 2,000 years to understand human intelligence and perception and action, and you philosophers didn't get it, but we've got it, and so you just better retire and leave, leave this question of what it is to be a human being and how they work to us. But when I was at Iran, I began to study the memos that led up to this discovery of cognitive science. And I found to my surprise that far from replacing philosophy, for replacing philosophy, the pioneers in artificial intelligence had learned a lot directly and indirectly from the philosophers. This is only going to be really illuminating to people who've had philosophy in some course or other, but I can't resist showing that, that all these ideas really come from philosophers. They, Hobbes was back, back in the 1600s. I guess it was 1600s. So I'm not very good at dates. Anyway, Hobbes was um, claimed that reasoning was calculating. That was a big deal. Insight, important claim. And Descartes, about the same time, Talked to, to discovered mental representations that all of our relation to the world is mediated by these representations in our mind. Then Leibniz came along and he proposed and worked out to some extent what he called a universal characteristic, which is a set of primitives in which all knowledge can be expressed. Of course, he didn't get it all at all, but he he was trying. And Kant claimed. The concepts were rules, and Frege came along, the last of these great philosophers in, in the history of things right up to now, and Frege formula, said you could form, formalize these rules. And in that way, the philosophers had already covered all the ground. Uh, without realizing it, the AI researchers were hard at work turning traditional philosophy into a research program. And I want to jump ahead and say, and a losing one, both for the traditional philosophers in a way and definitely for the AI people. Newell and Simon saw, but, the, but Newell and Simon were happy. They saw their work as a first step toward AI and they claimed that, quote, into, these quotes are, are amazing. Intuition, insight, and learning are no longer exclusive possessions of human beings. Any large, high-speed computer can be programmed to exhibit them." Unquote. The supposition that programs are a first step towards artificial intelligence, however, presupposed that research in AI was on the right track. That there was a continuum leading from current work in AI uh, what? Leading, ah, uh, the, the, let's try that again. That there was a continuum leading from current work to successful AI. What obviously was missing, well, ah, now I got it. This way of thinking was an example of what logician Yoshua, Yo, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Yehoshua Barhillo called the first step fallacy. Building into the notion of a first, built into the notion of a first step is that it is a first step towards success, not a first step towards failure. To claim that one's made a genuine first step towards climbing a mountain, say, one must already have reason to believe that by going on that way, you'll reach the top of the mountain. First step talk thus presupposes the idea of a successful last step built into the notion of a first step, even though they provide no argument for this implicit claim that you're, they're on the right w w track to achieve their goal. I mean, they just assume it. Um, and so my, my brother, who was a, a professor at Cal also, uh, the applied math person, listened to this and he said, it's like claiming that the first primate to climb a tree was taking a first step toward flight to the moon. And that's, that's how it is with, with this funny claim of first step. 
but enthusiasts might well, but but that's not really true. The Climbing a tree is not a first step toward flight to the moon. The enthusiasts might well have overlooked some serious problem along the way. And indeed, it turned out that the first step assumption was a bad basis for optimism concerning symbolic AI. There was, in fact, a kind of discontinuity in this assumed continuum of incremental progress, which is what the first step claim really implicitly is. So, so using Heidegger's being in time, since, or really just the very first half of Heidegger's very, very important early work, being in time, the first half of being in time, turned, which I was studying, turned out to be a guide for thinking about AI. And I began to see that AI researchers were running up against a pro- the problem of representing and updating relevance, a problem that Heidegger saw was implicit in Descartes' understanding of the world as a collection of meaningless facts represented to the mind, to which the mind then assigned what Descartes called values. I don't know if anybody of this group would be taking courses in the philosophy department. How many of anybody had any John Searle philosophy of mind courses? Well, this is this was Descartes was the first of these, and the current latest is John Searle saying we assign function predicates to something, say, like a hammer is just a brute thing, and but it, it doesn't have any meaning at all, but we give it the meaning, say, to a hammer, to hammer with. But Heidegger warned that values, or these value predicates, were just more meaningless facts and so could not solve the problem of representing relevance. You'll see what that means in a minute. To assign to hammers the function hammering leaves out what makes sense of hammering, namely the relation of hammers to nails, to other equipment, to the point of building things, to the skills required when actually using a hammer, all of that is not captured in just saying that we assign the value to the hammer with to this thing, the hammer. That is, Heidegger saw that assigning isolated function predicates to brute facts couldn't capture the meaningful organization of the everyday world of equipment in which hammering makes sense. And what was missing? Well, what was obviously missing was a representation of our way of life. That's not my view, but if you believe that it's all got to be understood in terms of mental representations, then they, so to speak, need to give an explanation of our everyday way of life in which hammers fit. So that, but they they couldn't really deal with the problem of representing the world. Uh, if the world were just a kind of aggregate of facts, they could just represent this whole big bunch of facts. But as Heidegger points out, it is the taken for gra- the, wo- the world is the taken for granted holistic background of familiar skills and practices on the basis of which particular facts make sense. That's just an abstract way of saying the, the hammer example. But and if, if and now the philosophers, uh, well, I mean, philosophers had made the same mistake. Descartes, a very important, powerful philosopher, but and Heidegger is a very has to be a very brilliant and uh, philosopher to break out of Descartes. And, and in the AI world, they actually were uh, up on this sort of Descartes view. But that only meant that they're turning this Descartes view into a research program, far from showing that philosophy was dead, shows that they were doomed. But they didn't know that yet. And so we, you'll see it this way. So Marvin Minsky, head of the MIT AI lab, was unaware of Heidegger's critique. He was convinced that all that was needed to achieve AI was representing and organizing a few million facts. It seemed to me, however, that the deep problem wasn't storing and retrieving millions of facts. It was knowing how to zoom in on those facts that are relevant in the current situation. The so-called frame problem is, wasn't, the so-called frame problem, where are we? Okay, is, 
Okay, okay. Is, is a version of the relevance problem. If the computer is running a representation of the current state of the world and something in the world changes, how does the program determine which of its other representative, represented facts can be assumed to have stayed the same and which have to be updated? For example, uh -oh, no. for example, if a student enters my office, what facts about my office are relevant and may have to be updated? The intensity of the illumination, the temperature, maybe the shadows, but you, you don't. But not, for instance, the solidity of the floor or the number of books on the shelves. So, it means, so what are you going to do about that? That there's all these millions of facts but only a few of them are relevant to the current situation. Well, Minsky suggested that to avoid the relevance problem, AI programmers could use what he called frames, representing the relevant facts in a typical situation, like, say, going to a birthday party. That was his example, a birthday party frame. When I arrive at a birthday party, my birthday party frame leads me to take account of those and only those facts that are normally relevant at birthday parties. For example, the gifts and the goodies, but not the temperature or the force of gravity or the clouds in that day. But a system of frames isn't in a situation. So in order to select the possibly relevant facts in the current situation, one needs a frame for recognizing the current situation as, say, a birthday party and for telling it apart from programs, apart from other situations, such as ordering in a restaurant. And how, I wondered, could the computer select the relevant frame for selecting the birthday party frame as the relevant frame so as to zoom in on the current relevance of, say, an exchange of gifts, but not, an, not rele what, as, and leaving out as irrelevant an exchange of money. So it seemed to me obvious that any AI program using frames to organize millions of meaningless facts so as to retrieve the currently relevant ones was going to be caught in a regress of frames for recognizing relevant frames for recognizing relevant facts and that the, therefore the frame problem wasn't just a problem, it was a sign that something was seriously wrong with the whole approach, which I think is was right. But well, so the, the AI people had an amazing capacity for, uh, for trying to th not think about it or avoid it or take up the shortcut of the Minsky, uh, frame, uh, Minsky way of dealing with it. With, uh, and uh, they, never, they never really could deal with it. But then how, how I wondered, thinking about they, how they couldn't deal with this question of how to zoom in, on what's, what's relevant in a current situation, uh, the question is how do we manage to organize the vast array of facts that supposedly makes up common sense knowledge so that we can d update just those and only those facts that are relevant in the current situation? The answer, according to Heidegger, is that we can't manage to do that any more than a computer can. But fortunately, we don't have to manage to do that. How is that? Well, uh, we always, and this is a crucial Heidegger idea, we always find ourselves already in a world, a situation, organized in terms of our abilities and bodies and needs, and hence a world, per, world permeated by significance and relevance. According to Heidegger, then, we don't normally give brute facts meaning. Rather, we're gradually socialized from the start into shared practices and skills for getting around in the world, and this general background familiarity determines what at any given moment attracts our attention as relevant. Now, very important idea of that, and, and it's simple once you hear it, but it, n nobody had figured that out until uh, Heidegger came along and said it. We, and, oh, where are we? Only if we, oh yeah, next thought. Only if we stand back from our involvement in the world and represent things from a detached perspective, which is what Descartes and Searle do, do we confront the problem of relevance. 
In his critique of Descartes, Heidegger concluded that if one strips away relevance, that's the stepping back, and starts with context-free bare facts, you can't get relevance back. That's what the frame problem really shows. Unfortunately, what characterized AI, at MIT at least, in those days was its refusal to face up to and learn from its failures, the failure to deal with the frame, frame problem. In this case, to avoid facing the relevance problem, the AI programmers at MIT in the 60s and early 70s limited their programs to what they called micro-worlds. Uh, artificial, what's a micro-world? An artificial domain in which a small number of features that were possibly relevant were determined beforehand. That's the Minsky move. However, since this approach obviously avoided the real-world relevance problem, PhD students at MIT felt obliged to claim in their theses that their micro-worlds could be made more and more realistic and that the techniques they introduced could then be generalized to cover relevance. But nobody ever succeeded in doing that. There were never any follow-ups to these theses. Now, that's when the good guy comes in, Terry Winograd. The work of Terry Winograd is somebody, work of somebody who's going to face this problem. His blocks, were, but he starts in the micro-world business. So Winograd's blocks, blocks world program, Shurdlu, I mean, these were things that were hot things when I was just coming to MIT in the 60s and when they were just getting a grip on AI. Shurdlu was um, considered terrific. It could respond to commands in ordinary English, instructing a virtual robot arm to move blocks displayed on a computer screen. And that um, turns out to be a micro world that really worked. But, of course, only in its micro world, only in, in the world of blocks. Um, so to develop the expected generalizations of his techniques to the relevance problem, Winograd started working on what he called the knowledge representation language, KRL. But I'm not, and I've never been sure, I never asked him, I wish I had. So what was, what was KRL trying to do? Well, it was somehow trying to rank relevance, and he had some, trying to find some algorithms for doing that, but he couldn't. So Winograd, but Winograd, unlike his colleagues, was conscientious and open to open-minded enough to try to figure out what was going wrong. So he suggested to me that we discuss his problem in a broader philosophical context. And looking back, Winograd says, I can't resist quoting this, my own work in computer science is greatly influenced by conversations with Dreyfus over a period of many years. And, and that's... That's nice. I, we were on the same side, it turned out. After a year of such conversation, and after reading the relevant texts of the existential phenomenologists, meaning Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty, but really only Heidegger, I think, for Winograd, Winograd abandoned his work on KRL. He continued, however, this is just an aside, but it's fascinating, to direct the dissertation work of Sergey Brin and Lawrence Page. I trust that means something to people. And, on, and what work by, what, by them? On retrieving and ranking relevant information from a database of possibly relevant information. He was still working, I mean, they were still working on the right question. Brin and Page never received Stanford PhDs for complicated reasons, but their work became Google. And Winograd began including Heidegger in his Stanford computer science courses. That still does. And I'm I go over there to Stanford every year with a Terry teaches uh, this kind of things and do my usual Heidegger story. In the meantime, but now that's the end of that. And the ball passes to, to uh, Winograd and the Google gang. And the relevance problem is, in, in some domains anyway, has been somewhat coped with. In the meantime, the MIT Humanities Department had spun out, spun out a philosophy section, including analytic philosophers that you've probably never heard of and probably rightly so, Jerry Fodor, Hilary Putnam, James and Judith Thompson, and so forth. So it looked like there might be a chance of dialogue between continental and analytic philosophers. 
but it turns out that, there, that, the, cha that the relations between continental and analytic philosophers were utterly antagonistic. I mean, this is just sort of cultural background. And I, I'm sure some similar thing happened here too, but it, I, this is how it happened over there. Um, indeed, my MIT colleagues way of dealing with my interest in existential phenomenology was to virtually exclude me from the philosophy program. In my seven years as an assistant professor at MIT, I was never informed of a faculty meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that is, and, and w w yeah, and, but I heard strange, I heard strange rumors, however. A friend, a friendly assistant professor who went to these meetings told me that at one such meeting, it was decided that no library funds were to be spent on continental philosophy books devoted as they were to what my colleagues called Stone Age philosophy. <laughs> The, and it, it had its funny implications. The most up-to-date philosophers in those days believed that minds were software running on brains which were hardware. So I was not surprised to hear that Thompson, the philosophy guy, and Minsky were, quote, good friends. But what really was interesting and funny way this, this connection came out was the connection between uh, philosophers and AI researchers, when Hilary Putnam asked me earnestly one day when I would admit to being a Turing machine. And, <laughs> and I still haven't admitted it. Um, given this attitude, I was not surprised when I came up for tenure at MIT, the AI researchers and the philosophers too recommended to Jerry, Jerome Wiesner, the provost, that he opposed tenure for me. The AI researchers feared, now that gets real, real life, the AI researchers feared that my being a professor at MIT would lend credibility to my claim that symbolic AI, based as it was on the false assumption of the representational relation between mind and world, was bound to fail. The AI community was, the, interested, however, in somehow getting, getting me out of the picture. And, but they weren't interested really in answering my arguments, but sort of in destroying my credibility. So they encouraged Seymour Papert, who was sort of second in command after Minsky, to circulate a document entitled The Artificial Intelligence of Hubert L. Dreyfus. <laughs> This is amazing that things should go on at this level. And, then, and, what it, and it, this, in this document, they pointed out that I didn't know how to program, which is true. And, uh, <laughs> and, ridic and they ridiculed everything I did say as silly. Uh, so, but, but when I w realized that Minsky and his colleagues were, afra were afraid that my writings might fall into the hands of the officials at DARPA, the Defense Department, which supported MIT research to the tune of a million dollars a year, I figured I had to strike back, and I considered uh, scaring all the AI supporters uh, at MIT by hiring an actor to dress in uniform and lunch with me at the MIT faculty club. <laughs> However, before I could put my plan into effect, I was summoned to the Pentagon as a consultant. Anyway, <laughs> there, just as my MIT opponents feared, my recommendation that the military cut all AI support was taken seriously, presumably contributing to the drying up of DARPA support that came to be known as the AI winter. I think symbolic AI was dead and is dead and will always be dead and that's all right. There are better, there's better ways of doing AI, which I'll get to. Meanwhile, Wiesner had to decide whether or not to follow the philosophy section and block the humanities department, never mind these weird academic things, block the, the humanities department's recommendation of tenure for me. He, that is Wiesner, consulted computer scientists at Harvard, Bell Labs, and oddly enough, Novosibirsk, where the Russian AI people were, I gather. And he read an early draft of my book, What Computers Can't Do. And then he invited me into his office and personally offered me tenure. A strange thing, you know, when you really know how the world works. Uh, I said I was sorry, but I didn't feel comfortable at MIT's since my philosophy courses were not accepted by my colleagues 
Therefore, I was going to accept the pending offer from UC Berkeley. Then things got really weird. And I had to take a, <laughs> if, if, as if all that wasn't weird enough. But uh, I have to, it takes a little while to spell out what happened next. To encourage me to accept the offer of tenure, the Berkeley Philosophy Department invited me to visit for a semester, and I accepted. And, it, and that was just an aside, a wonderful experience. You, I mean, I'm afraid I, you have to be old like me not to have had it, I think. But that was a wonderful, dizzy time in the 60s out here in Berkeley. And fascinating to move back and forth between MIT and Berkeley, where at MIT, the super straight MIT dedicated students who looked like they had never left high school and who fell asleep in, at, at every moment because the uh, co-tech was hell and they always assigned more work than these students could ever do. The students were too dedicated. They stayed up day and night to do it. So I leave all that for Berkeley. Good old, the, leave the super straight students at MIT for the laid back world of Berkeley. The laid back world was wonderful. When I soon after I got here, I heard Janis Joplin singing on some street corner in Berkeley. I don't with the, with Big Brother and the Holding Company. I don't know when he more which street corner, but I was stunned. It was so impressive. And then um, the philosophy department, in the meantime, was a, assuring a sense of community in the department, and they organized an annual retreat at Asilomar, the place where people go for conferences and so forth, at which the majority of the graduate students and a number of the faculty dropped acid. That was amazing. Um, and it did create a new sense of togetherness. So I moved to the Bay Area. Uh, but right after that, uh, right after I left MIT for Berkeley, Houston Smith, I don't know how many have heard of Houston Smith. He's written this famous book of the religions of the world and so forth. Houston Smith, teaching the humanities at MIT, received an offer from Caltech to teach there. So, and Houston pointed out to the MIT deans that if I left for Berkeley, there would be no one among the philosophers at MIT for him to talk with, and that consequently he was seriously considering accepting the Caltech offer. So in a desperate attempt to save the MIT image of openness to the humanities from being trumped by Caltech, the high, author the high authorities at MIT offered to hire a Bert Dreyfus substitute as soon as possible. And in the meantime, they, they invited me back to MIT, uh, as, invited me back to MIT. So I thought that was nice too. I looked forward to coming back to Cambridge since I enjoyed discussing existential phenomenology with appreciative student electrical engineers. The main fans for that philosophy was were the electrical engineers. I, I've never understood why. I think they were just smart and knew what was going on. Um, so I accepted an MI, MIT offer to return from Berkeley to teach the humanities. But then it seemed the MIT philosophers must have made clear they didn't want an existentialist around teaching Stone Age philosophy. So this is a big problem. So in the end, in order to keep Houston Smith from leaving MIT for Caltech, MIT agreed to pay my full salary for at least a semester without my doing any teaching at all. My own... <laughs> yeah, my, own my only job was talking with Houston Smith about Heidegger. <laughs> Oh, so, my, so my experience of teaching, and eventually not teaching, existential phenomenology at MIT had a happy ending. I left for Berkeley for good, and Winograd sums up what happened at MIT. Uh, a quote from Winograd. From those who have followed the history of artificial intelligence, it's ironic that the MIT laboratory should become a cradle of a Heideggerian AI. It was at MIT that Dreyfus first formulated his critique, and for 20 years, the intellectual atmosphere in the AI lab was overtly hostile, hostile to recognizing the implications of what he said. Nevertheless, some of the work now being done at that laboratory, MIT, seems to have been affected by Heidegger and Dreyfus. And that's Winograd's view, and, uh, and right, I guess. Well, and, well, how did that exactly? It's fun to, to know how that happened. It was not just simple. Uh, so in, in uh, March of 1986, a new director of the MIT AI lab, Patrick Winston, uh, m moderated Minsky's hostile attitude toward me and allowed, 
if he didn't encourage, several graduate students to invite me to give a talk to the AI community. I entitled my talk, Why AI Researchers Should Study Being in Time. The talk was well attended, but not everyone was pleased. I was told by Phil Agri, the graduate student who invited me to give the talk, that after it was announced that I was going to speak, Minsky came into his office and shouted at him for 10 minutes or so for inviting me. I wish I was been a fly on the wall and seen that scene. In my talk, which I did give, um, I, I repeated what I'd written in 1972 in What Computers Can't Do, quote, the meaningful objects among which we live are not models of the world stored in our mind or brain, they are the world itself. Well, that's, that's pretty obscure, but it, it got clearer as things went on, which I, it's important, so it's, we'll go on with it. At the same time, Rodney Brooks, he is the the, he, Win, Winograd and Brooks are my heroes. At the same time, Rodney Brooks took over as head of the MIT AI lab and renounced thinking in terms of representations. Recalling the frame problem, he reported that based on the idea that, quote, the best model of the world is the world itself, unquote, he had, quote, developed a new approach in which a mobile robot uses the external world itself as its representation continually referring to its sensors rather than internal, the, uh, an internal world model. Again, quote, it never referred to an internal description of the world that would quickly get out of date if anything in the real world moved, he said. And said so that's right. Brooks is on to the right track. So Brooks works in an important advance over symbolic AI. But his robots respond only to those features of the environment determined by the robot's receptors. That's how it cuts down the, what's relevant. Uh, by operating in a fixed world, responding to the set of possibly relevant features determined by their receptors, Brooks ant-like animates, animates, as he calls them, begged the question of changing relevance and so finessed rather than solved the frame problem. That's, that's, the, best anybody, that's the best anybody could do. Yet, in spite of the history of AI research, and now, now comes a little aside again of craziness. I mean, there's so much craziness, it's hard to know how much to put in, but this one I couldn't resist. Yet, in spite of the history of AI research based on, for, based on the first step fallacy, the next step was apparently irresistible. Brooks and Daniel Dennett, philosopher at Tufts, succumbed to the sort of extravagant optimism characteristic of AI researchers in the 60s. On the basis of Brooks' success with ant-like devices, instead of trying to make an artificial spider, Brooks and Dennett decided to leap ahead on the supposed continuum from insects to humans and build a humanoid robot. As Dennett explained in a 1994 report, quote, a team at MIT, of which I'm a part, is now embarking on a long-term project to design and build a humanoid robot, COG, capital C-O-G. How many know about COG? I, I don't know what audience I'm talking to. So this torso, sort of metal torso with movable arms and a movable head, that's, that's COG. Um, and, and, the, and this is what we hear about COG from Dennett. A team at MIT, of which I am a part, is now embarking on a long-term project to design and build a humanoid robot, COG, whose con cognitive talents will include speech, eye coordination, manipulation of objects, and a host of self-protective, self-regulatory, and self-exploring activities, unquote. Then it seems to reduce the project to a joke when he adds, a, but, but apparently in all seriousness, quote, while we're at it, we might as well make, try to make Cog crave human praise and company and exhibit a sense of humor, unquote. Absolutely weird. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it couldn't, of course, even understand natural language. It couldn't do anything. Of course, the long-term project was short-lived, Cog failed to achieve any of the goals of the of the of the Dennett mentions or any of the, its goals. And as 2003, all development of Cog had ceased. Cog is now in a museum. Boy, though it is hard to find this out. You have to sort of track it down through Google and so forth. The failures, recognizing their failures, is not a 
very high priority for the AI people. But as far as I know, neither Brooks nor Dennett nor anybody else connected with the project has published an account of the failure and what mistaken assumptions much, must underlie this, uh, their absurd optimism. In a personal communication, Dennett Trudeau, first, a wonderful example of first step thinking, claimed that, quote, progress was being made on all the goals, but slower than had been anticipated. Uh, weird, you see, though, that's, that's the first step fallacy. Um, in, in any case, Brooks insists that he does not owe to high, what? Where do I get that? Uh, okay, I, I skipped a paragraph. So, but clearly something had gone wrong. Some specific assumptions must have been mistaken. But all we find in Dennett's assessment is the implicit assumption that human intelligence is on a continuum with insect intelligence and therefore adding a bit of complexity that what had already been accomplished with Brooks Animates counts as progress. It's the tree, tree climbing to get to the moon mentality. In any case, Brooks insists that he does not owe to Heidegger his idea of replacing symbolic representations in a computer. So, so, so now Brooks is so. Oh, let me think. Of that. Yeah, Brooks is okay. Now we, I'm switching from the Dennett Cog failed Dennett Cog uh, situation uh, to where the action really was. Brooks insists that he does not owe to Heidegger his idea of replacing symbolic representations in a computer with embodied moving robots in direct contact with the world. Indeed, he explicitly denies any such influence. I think it's very interesting that there could be two such diverse departments and such diverse people would, who would come up equally with this radical idea. You wouldn't think it would have to be radical, but thanks to Descartes and everything being inside the mind. But these guys came up with this radical idea that we're in direct contact with the world. Heidegger on the one hand, and now Brooks is saying, yes, but I, I got that idea too. And it's almost the same time. I think I wrote it down a little earlier, but it's, it's almost exactly the same time. He, he, he has this idea. And he says, in some circles, much credence is given to Heidegger, who, as one who understood the dynamics of existence. Our approach has, sim has certain similarities to work inspired by this German philosopher, but our work was not so inspired. It was based purely on engineering considerations. And when I, up to recently, up to a few weeks ago, I think, I just thought that was probably wrong. But now the more I read Brooks and think about Brooks, I think that's right. He did it and saw it on his own. Although he quite plausibly doesn't credit the direct influence of Heidegger on him, Brooks does give me credit for, quote, bringing about many issues, being right about many issues, such as the way in which people operate in the world is intimately coupled to the existence of their body. That's... That's really Merleau-Ponty talk. It is, Heidegger doesn't care about body. That's a funny thing in him. One sentence in Being in Time is about the fact that we have bodies. But, but Brooks has got the best of both worlds in a way. He sees, he, he picks up the idea that somehow you've got to understand that embodied humanoid robots relate directly to the world. Uh, just what could be learned from a... Co and, and now, final reflection on this. Just what could be learned from a... Com learned from a comparative study of embodied human beings and embodied humanoid robots? That's an interesting question. I'd like to conclude by suggesting how those engaged in constructing embodied humanoid computer systems and those spelling out an existential phenomenological description of embodied human behavior might find common ground and learn from each other. Now this is all, now I'm out in nowhere land because in an area where nobody understands much of what's going on. But, so I bring in a co my colleague at MIT, Samuel Totus, of another existential phenomenologist who did lose his job when they discovered that he was doing Stone Age philosophy. But in fact, he was a brilliant uh, existential phenomenologist and he had a whole, a whole book 
called Body and World, in which he ex works out in detail how the structure of the human body is related to the structure of the human world. The structure is so pervasive, it's difficult to see, but it's been described by Totus, so now we can see it. He calls attention to the fact that the human body, and now I, I just can't resist reading this. It, it is so obvious once you see it, but so pervasive and basic that you don't normally see it. And it seems so, I don't know, I have a funny uh, kind of uh, shiver every time I read it because I, I find it so fascinating and so obvious. So the, the human body has a front, back, and up, up, down orientation. You check this on your body as you hear it. It moves forward more easily than backward. You can successfully cope only with what's in front of it. And, uh, and now I want to say, and look at that, it's no accident that these structural characteristics, of course, also show up in humanoid robots. Yeah, I, maybe, I don't know about whether they move for easily, more easily forward than backward, but I, I bet they do, although maybe they could be fixed so they didn't, and maybe that would be a problem because they shouldn't. Anyway, then, so it, it moves forward more easily than it copes than backward, and it's no accident that the, so there's a structural parallel between what the Heideggerian existential people and what the uh, robot people were doing. Um, Totus further describes how in order to orient ourselves and to explore our surrounding world, which everybody admits the robot had better be able to do, we have to be balanced, in, we at least, and I guess the robot too, has to be balanced in a vertical field that we don't produce. We have to be directed in a, to a surrounding field that is facing one aspect of the field around us rather than another. Uh, and we have to be set to respond to the specific things we encounter within that field. Robot builders are, per now that's, that's the totus, I, I want to say, robot builders are presumably already unconsciously guided by such characteristics. I mean, when they're going to build humanoid robots, they're going to have up, down, front, back, and they're going to orient themselves in the world and have to take account of the gravitational field. Um, and it would probably be useful to, that they become more and more aware of this so that they know what they're building into their humanoid robots that, that makes them humanoid, namely that, that they have bodies which are structured like ours. Totus describes in detail how intelligent activity is an embodied, quote now, an embodied, normative, skillful accomplishment. And it, it's in a response to our need to orient ourselves in the world. I mean, that's what the robots don't have, and I don't understand how they could get it, but until they get it, they're going to be very unhumanoid. So it's important that human beings, I'll just read it again, uh, are they have an embodied, normative, skillful accomplishment, namely, they are able to orient themselves in the world. That's discovering the extent to which humanoid robots can and must share bodily skills with human beings may well turn out to be an important guide to future research. I wish I could give it, but I, I just sort of intuit it must be there. Rejecting symbolic representations and incorporating an existential phenomenological account of the basic skills that underlie our direct bodily coping with the world may lead to the recognition and programming of unnoticed pervasive capacities that we necessarily share with humanoid robots. That would be great. Then the humanoid robot people and the existential, the embodied, embedded existential phenomenology people would be learning from each other. Specifically, embodied robots that move so as to get a better and greater, better grip on the world might turn out to be a true first step to AI. But of course, we can't know whether it's a first step until we've actually succeeded. Okay. So I'll take questions uh, largely from the, the, from, the, from the audience, please. We have a microphone. Thank you. Professor Dreyfus, 
you seem to still be rejecting uh, symbolic AI. And I'm, I'm surprised what? at that, uh, rejecting symbolic AI. Yes. Uh, I'm surprised at that because it would seem that what is needed in the field and what the field will eventually develop into is a combination of symbolic AI on the one hand and embodied AI on the other hand. In other words, it will attempt to reproduce the human person, the human that I am. I am not just a body, I'm also a mind, but I'm not just a mind, I have also a body. We are both, and therefore a robot of the future and AI of the future will have to have both. How can you reject symbolic AI? Ah, that's a perfectly good question, and I don't, because <laughs> I couldn't, and, you sh and I shouldn't, because it's studying these higher level mental operations like decisions and uh, so, so forth. And so what I really want to do, and, and I should have said it more clearly, is I want to reject the what was the wrong sort of way to begin by starting at the top, so to speak, and doing the symbolic ones and not trying to figure out the basic ones and how the symbolic ones somehow grow out of the basic ones, which is not disagreeing with you, I mean, I think. They, and so they have to come back to, I mean, and this is a Rodney Brooks point. I really like his point when he keeps saying, we don't need to think, we don't want to start by thinking about central processors that make decisions and organize experience. We want to start by talking about the sort of an, 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 ant-like way we've managed as a well, not even ant-like because they don't develop skills. The particularly human way, that, and higher animal way, that we develop skills for getting around in the world. That uh, I'm, I talk louder. My wife is giving me signal. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> the, my, my director is over here. Um, so, so anyway, so yes, we shouldn't reject the symbolic, but we can't just take a shortcut to the symbolic. That was the big mistake in the 60s at MIT. And nobody knows or, how, or tries to figure out how the symbolic is grounded in the, the, the everyday coping with the, the world, but that's what they should be doing. And that's what Brooks is, knows that he knew when he was last writing about these things. Now he's sort of more in the business of actually selling robots like the Ramba. But, but, but anyway, Brooks knows and talks about how the important thing is to see that all of this has got to be grounded in basic skills. And then you can see how to build the, the cognitive AI on top of that. So I think there's no. I think you're right to sort of correct that. You, can't, you don't want to throw out the mind, and we do have representations in our mind, and those representations in our mind are absolutely essential for solving problems and finding uh, whatever it is we're, we need and so forth. And we have to figure out how to get there from developing the the kind of ant-like robots that uh, Brooks has done with one called Herbert, the latest one of the stuff I was reading, which I thought might have been a sort of mistaken reference to me and to Senator Hubert Trifus, but, but Herbert turns out to be Herb Simon. So I, I'm, not, I'm not implicated. I wish I were. Herbert's a good robot. Uh, More questions? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, Does sure. someone, do you want to call him? Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor Griffiths. Uh, so I just have a question about the um, current AI uh, developing. Um, so no nowadays, um, scientists are really crazy about developing this kind of intelligent, uh, artificial uh, artificial intelligence. But my concern is, um, what if, like, in the future, uh, they are super, 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 super developed and uh, um, they end up still um, stealing our jobs because, you know, uh, they can do, they are smarter, they are faster, and uh, well, in, so people won't have their actual job, but uh, the ro robots will do that. And uh, um, also, I wanted to, um, it's just pop up in my mind that, um, so because the, the AI is so like uh, modernized and hu hu uh, hu um, it's like more human. So um, is there a possibility or anything that um, people will actually give them human rights? 
So, um, like. Can you just keep it to very brief questions because everyone has many questions. Oh, sorry. Well, I guess that you can just stop with that about what, what about human rights for robots. Is that right? When I first came out here to what, what, 30 years ago now or whatever it was, is that right? About 40? 50? <laughs> <laughs> who, who'll make it 100? Uh, so, so anyway, that, that I was giving a course with a philosopher named Michael Scriven who was worrying about the question, should you allow your daughter to marry a robot? And... Uh, I said, but I, that's just going too far. And, and human rights is another thing. They're not human, and they don't have rights. And uh, eventually, I suppose, if they become enough like humans, they will have to worry about that question. Uh, so, so, so I'm not, I mean, but it's sort of premature to worry about it. Uh, that we better worry about how they can manage to find their way uh, around a maze or like a rat or something. If, if that's that's would be even now, I think, beyond them. And one of the things I didn't put in my paper because I didn't know what to do with it is that there nobody's talking about learning. But learning, seems, even even Rodney, Rodney Brooks, animats don't learn anything, and I think nobody has a clue as, as to make. Two things that people don't know how to do, and I certainly not going to, I don't have no idea, but I, I know we better figure it out. One is, the, is learning and how robots are, are, we have to have robots that can learn. Ants can't learn, and, and Brooks is right, what, calling what he calls animates, which, which don't learn. And now I've forgotten the other one, though. Two things. Hold on, another question. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, I have to be very brief, so I'm trying to, how to focus that. Two things. If, if you look at what people like Brooks do, but also people like uh, Pfeiffer, uh, for instance. Um, who? Maybe I don't Pfeiffer, know. Rolf Pfeiffer, who does uh, morphological computation, building um, uh, complete agents, what he calls, based on machine learning, ah. but in the body, outside, in the world, etc. Ah. So which, which uh, goes very much with the, the central tenets of your work, though he has no references, I think, to continental philosophy. But what I want to say is there is, on the one hand, going bottom-up with an embodied uh, robot like uh, Brooks does, so you're somewhere on the ant level, the insect level, on the other hand, we have neural nets, we have machine learning, mm. we have page rank, and everything that is now happening online. So that's not embodied, it is software, but it's very advanced. And I'm trying to figure out what is your message about that, because cloud robotics is going to put those two together. Wow. And you better tell me. It to relates to the question that, that uh, you better give the gentleman us a reference behind me asked. So I can read up on this and then I'll have an opinion but I, I don't know this work uh, and so you, you, you don't go run away without telling me or, or, or sure. emailing me dreyfus yeah. at berkeley.edu what, what I'm supposed <laughs> what I'm supposed to look at other questions Well, this sort of sort of builds on it, builds on a little bit too. But I'm sort of wondering about you because you mentioned like Google's PageRank and that sort of sort of things that that kind of came around, uh, uh, came from that uh, sort of line of research. Wondering sort of what the how to avoid sort of mistakes of symbolic AI when dealing with uh, sort of agents or artificial agents that operate in a primarily symbolic world. And I'm thinking sort of can we talk of does it make sense to you to talk about concepts of like how PageRank is embodied in the internet or what it means to be sort Wait, of thrown. How what? How, how, how page rank is sort of embodied in the, or sort of thrown into the world of hyperlinks online. How it sort of, does, it, does, does attributing some sort of concept of, of agency or experience to some sort of uh, algorithmic agent, sort of, is that something that, 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 that makes sense or should we avoid that or should we, you know, what, what's your intuition on that? Gee, these are fascinating things. I said, but there's a certain word I don't get. It sounded like to me like capering, which that's what what were you just? So what? Google's algorithm for sort of ranking different, you know, what's the most relevant? Ah, oh, I see. Yes, the well, the Google ranking is fascinating because that it should be done with Winograd and that the, and and that it's and and he's interested interested in Heidegger. So, but so I, I don't know anything 
more about the Google ranking than the, than the, the basic thing that the algorithm keeps track of how many connections there are to the various items and how many connections there are to the connections to those and so forth. And, and, what, am, and what are you asking? That, that I, should, I should care about that. Well, does, does it make sense to you to sort of talk about that as a kind of experience or a kind of embodiment? Or kind ah, of I see. I see. Let me think about that. Uh, well, there must be some embodied uh, experiential version of it. Uh, I want, and I'm surprised that Winograd hasn't gotten onto that. Maybe he has, and he's just not talking about it. Um, but if, if you know anything on the subject that I should read, let me know. Uh, and, 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 but, and you remind me of the thing. Remember I said two things. Learning, which is one. And the other is that the, that the robot is out trying to get a better and better grip on the world. I mean, we are. And how, we're, how in the world one builds that into their AI? This ten, I mean, the nearest thing I know is that Brooks' um, Herbert goes around and is trying to find as many pop bottles as possible. But that's a, well, that's Bert, a long, long way. Well, one thing I'm just maybe yeah. following that question is that there's a lot of talk right now about collective intelligence. Oh, yeah. Now, collective intelligence is what is how to amplify the, 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 the intelligence of a group of individuals and how can they, in other ah. words, solve problems more oh. effectively. Yeah, yeah. And that is somewhat what's going on, I think, with Google search engine because it really isn't just an algorithm. It, it's using the ah, yeah. decisions and the subjective judgment of millions of people in the way they set up their web pages. It mines those with an algorithm, but Good. it's using the human intuition at its very core, and that's why it's so successful. Good. Yes. Yes. That that's, I, that makes sense. And so there's a lot of interesting questions to be raised about how to enhance this. Google's algorithm is not the end, the the final say. There's many many enhancements being pursued. In other words, how can you take this this all this data from human activity and combine it in in effective ways that will actually yield more more powerful insights from ourselves? And I think that's what really raises some really interesting questions far beyond what was asked by the MIT researchers who just felt it was enough to put a bunch of machines in a room. They weren't, they weren't tapping into what we call crowdsourcing or this kind of you know, collective that's intelligence. That's, that's, and that, that requires this, brute, this huge amount of processing power, and it's, it's a kind of brute force way of solving the problem, it seems to me. We have to talk about that. Right. Good. All right. Time for just two more questions. Mine's just actually related to what um, I'm kind of wanted to hear a bit more about this learning um, thing you mentioned that that people aren't thinking about learning. Um, you must mean something slightly different than what I'm thinking because um, it seems to me that that is kind of the core of the research in AI right now. And then if you look at like Turing's paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, 1950, there's a pair. There's a he talks about like a domain like chess, which is extremely symbolic, but the next thing he talks about is, well, possibly the uh, Turing test mach passing machine might need to have a body and we need to get by it the best sensors money can buy and teach it English, something, something like uh, very learning uh, oriented and embodiment is already kind of found there. So um, what do you mean by how people are not considering learning and... What do I would, mean by what? Would this kind of learning that was mentioned as early as Turing not be learning uh, and related to robotics? Well, I don't really understand that. I mean, there, there, there's no learning in Turing. Oh, is you right? said that yeah. people weren't paying attention, enough attention to learning. I see. Was Turing paying attention to learning? Yes. Really? I will, I will send you yeah, Send the me something. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get lots of emails. <laughs> You need a body to move the microphone up back there. Uh, so to the field of AI, you're seen as uh, the grand hater uh, in some sense. And that's actually something I wanted to, I don't say that in a negative sense, although it sounds that way. Uh, uh, you've outlined all of the different ways that AI has failed. And I wanted to know whether you, I actually find it very productive because what you're able to do is, for example, put to work a lot of the ideas that you see in Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty and show their practical consequences in an actual research program. 
So I was wondering what you would think of the idea that the purpose of AI as a project would be to actually just produce these colossal failures and that that would be its primary. No, it's not a joke. I mean, this is, it's clear that you can learn a lot from that. So yeah, I think just that, what do you think about this idea that the primary yeah. purpose of AI would be to fail to represent or I mean, perform? I'm not sure behavior? I could, I mean, I don't hear too well and I may not have understood you, but I, I think if I did, yes, the failures of AI would be very important and to get and to see what the wrong way to thinking about these things are and uh, things like human activities, skill, and so forth, and embodiment. Uh, but, and, and the fact that the AI, and, and if only the AI people would pay attention to their failures, it was important to learn about how you, can't, you shouldn't start with the, the representational cognitive function. Maybe you shouldn't. It didn't work when they tried it, uh, and but it's going to come in some other way. With his point, um, so, but I'm not sure. But did I hear you? I mean, what, what what do you mean by the colossal failures, and what should they do with them? Well, there's a lot that you can learn from the. There's a lot that you can learn from the way that any system fails, and that's sort of what you've outlined. And that, um, I mean, if you, okay, it seems yeah. like you're suggesting that parallel to AI would be a program of doing. St- like consistent post-mortem of how this failed and how this didn't Good. work and I, I what we I, learn about human behavior from the way that something fails to satisfy our desires of a particular technology that would embody it. So if you could just give an idea of how this sort of, because you seem to suggest this research program in your work and you know how would you think about this sort of post-mortem approach to AI? Okay, I think I, I mean, I, as I say, I have trouble hearing, but if I understand right, I think that's you know, well, the moral of this paper might well be the AI people should pay attention to their failures, that they've got some colossal failures like COG, it's just so perfectly failed, and the Minsky project of frames just totally failed. There's something to be learned from that, and not to, just to hide it under the carpet, and that the AI people should, would make, progress if they would ask themselves, how come this didn't work the way we promised and predicted and believed it would work? Is, am I, is that what you're saying? Well, well, it, well I think a bigger, a bigger point being made here is that the, the, that all, and in fact, all fields can be read as, as a sequence of failures from one, perspe- one perspective. There's always new ideas, new paradigms being em- that emerge. And one of the things that is that we are always faced with is the next new paradigm, right? If it's the one I remember very recently was nanotechnology, nano machines that were going to be swimming through our our bloodstreams, and there was a huge amount of surge of uh, enthusiasm about this just a few years ago, and that hasn't really developed in the same way that it was envisioned. Good, good. I, I, so, I thought it wouldn't. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I think there's, a, there's something to, interesting for us to all to be thinking about is that, um, that we do get these irrational exuberances around a variety of different technologies. And this is one story that's so effective where there was a huge, you know, there was a massive uh, uh, consensual hallucination going on that everyone believed that this was going to work. And it was really, you were alone at that time and seeing through it. And, you know, the, the emperor's new clothes. And I think that that's really a great tale for us to what is the next one? What are the illusions that we're under right now? Oh, yeah, I know what the next one is. Yeah. <laughs> it's the uh, uh, Obama idea that we're going to put in a lot of money and get every element of the brain, mapping the brain. That's the latest craziness. I mean, that, that there are something like 100 billion neurons with something like 10,000 connections on each, and, and it's all done with, with, with uh, chemicals and so forth. The, the idea that they, how can, how can they possibly want to spend valuable research money on that? Yeah. <laughs> all right, I think we have a great topic for lunch today. Thank you, Professor Dreyfus.